Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very exciting, a special edition of It Depends podcast. Bob Muglia was in my studios, if you can call it that, in September of 2022. We were having this wide ranging discussion. Bob was talking about his interest into foundation models. And at that time, he was explaining what is a foundation model. Little did we know that two months later, chat GPT is going to come out and AI is going to take over all our conversations. The world's been turned upside down. In the time since Bob was uh, last on my podcast, he's published a book. It's called The Datapreneurs. This is my copy. I've read it cover to cover. It is absolutely a must read for anyone who wants to understand the trajectory of, of technology, especially in this data and analytics space over the last few decades, and, and a, a deep discussion on where we are heading next. So today we get to talk about that. Bob, I am delighted to have you back uh, on my podcast. Great to be here again. It's great. It was, I enjoyed it last time. It'll be fun today. Thank you. Yes, last time was, was a blast. So I want to start with a little bit of a sensitive topic. And only because you mentioned it in the beginning of the book about your exit from Snowflake and your surprise on getting a call that Snowflake's board of directors had replaced you and Frank Slutman took over. Can you tell us what was it like to leave Snowflake after leading the company for five years? Well, it wasn't easy. It was hard. It was it was it was one of the hardest things that's happened to me, actually. And it been partially because it was a surprise. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't prepared for it. Maybe I should have been in retrospect, like all these sorts of things. There are signs. But I think it's common that, you know, when when managers, you know, have when there's a difference of opinion and there was a difference of opinion with myself and some members of the board. Um, when these things happen, I, and, and there is a, a, decide, a decision to, to, to change somebody out. I think it's common that managers don't really prepare people as well. As they might, as they might have done so. So that was made it a little bit more difficult. But uh, it was, you know, I came back to to up here to Seattle. I moved back up here at that point in time because I had moved my residence down to to California. Although my wife had stayed up here the entire time and maintained a residency up in, in Washington State. And then, you know, I took that year. I took the rest of the year. This was 2019 to really think about what I wanted to do in the future. And, and my wife made me promise to not do anything until 2020. So I waited until shortly into 2020. And then I started joining a few boards. And that's mostly what I've been doing since then. I've been on five boards um, and you know that keeps me pretty busy. I coach and advise, work with a bunch of CEOs of small companies, learn about what they're doing. I do some casual investing associated with that, mostly trying to uh, associate with trying to learn things and help people out that I, I think would be fun to work with. Uh, datapreneurs of the future, as I tend to think about them, future datapreneurs. Um, and that's what I've been spending my time doing. And, and yes, I wrote a book. I got that done uh, recently, and I'm pleased to have that launched and out and available for people. So, uh, Bob, I have to say you are an inspiration you have really reinvented yourself. You're an entrepreneur, an investor, a coach, and if I may, a student, because I see you're constantly learning what's going on and now vector databases have come into existence. I'm just curious, how easy or hard has it been to transition from being in the hot seat as a CEO to, to the role that you have now? Well, like I say, it was a surprise at first. It took me a little while to get used to it. But I definitely like it. I mean, I, 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 I definitely don't want to go back at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm 63 years old. I, I, you know, I'm at a point in my career where I don't really want to go do another operating role. It's hard being, not, being a CEO. It's a lot of work, just an incredibly large amount of work. And I'm not sure I want to work quite that hard anymore. I have a lot more control over my calendar right now. Um, uh, and that's, and I very much value that. So that's been good. I, I can actually uh, agree with that. Since I went independent, the only meetings I have on my calendar are the ones that I want. Exactly. Agreed to. Otherwise... At least you agree to them. I mean, you don't always want them, but at least you Correct. agree to them. You agree to all. You agree yeah. to all of them, and that's one of the reasons why I don't have a have a, have an assistant to help me. Because, you know, one of the things I learned is that is that when you have an assistant, you lose control of your calendar. 
And I'm hopeful. I, I'm hopeful that that in a couple of years uh, I can get an assistant in Outlook that's built in, an AI assistant that I can be very precise about what I wanted to schedule for me, and I can it'll take all that that kind of the busy work out of maintaining a calendar. I'm hopeful that's just a couple of years away, or maybe even less. Wow. Yes. In fact, we'll be talking quite a bit about that because I, I saw artificial general. Uh, intelligence, AGI is such a big uh, topic in your book. But before we get there, I want I have a question about Snowflake that I've never really talked about. So I want to air it out with you. This is my theory, that if Oracle had been visionary enough and Benoit and Thierry had uh, been allowed to carry on with the ideas of reimagining a data warehouse for native cloud, Snowflake would have never come around. Any thoughts? Like, uh, I mean, this, I feel like this this was... Well, it's a conceptually possible theory, certainly. I don't disagree with your concept. I don't think there's any practical truth to it in reality. A, I don't think that either one of them, you know, I think that they were probably ready to leave Oracle. I'll just start saying that. I'll say that. B, um, uh, the other thing is Oracle, it's very hard for a company like Oracle or any company with a large entrenched product, you know, an Oracle more than anybody because they had the biggest share and everything else is the largest corporations in the world. It's very hard for them to give up that code base and do something new. And the thing that Benoit and Terry decided from you know day one was they were going to start, you know, with a C compiler and Java. And that was their, you know, those are the, and, and Linux, and that's what they were, and the cloud. And that's what they're going to start with. And they wrote the whole database from scratch. I mean, they didn't even use Postgres. I mean, they didn't even go to Postgres and use the Postgres uh, uh, compiler or any part of Postgres to build what they built because they felt it was so different. It needed to be built from scratch. And it's almost impossible for a company that has a giant installed base like Oracle to make a decision to do that. Um, you know, even like if you look at what Microsoft, I've been watching in, and I work closely with the Microsoft team right now, watch what they've done. I mean, it's taken them years to reinvent uh, their, you know, they've now released Fabric and they're, you know, they've largely built that now. It's the code base has shifted to be a cloud based code base, but it took them years to get there from their original SQL Server code base. You know, and they they've gone down the path of when we bought Data Allegro, they went down a path of how they did distribution that was kind of a dead end path, and they got sidetracked with that for a while. It's just very typical. You have an investment, you stick with it. Yeah, since since we're talking about sensitive <laughs> topics, I have a beef with Microsoft. I'm be recording this, so I'm not even sure how much I should say these things, but. Uh, Microsoft Fabric just came out. I love the concept. I think it's such a, such a right thing to do. They have consolidated different pieces, so Synapse, uh, Microsoft Purview for Data Catalog. Power BI. Power BI, Azure Data Factory. So it's all and, and exactly the right move because I'm one of my huge areas of coverage is data products. Anything that can help me build a data product uh, you call it data. You talk a lot about data applications. I, I think it might be the same. Uh, the same thing. Data products, data. Sometimes they're called intelligent applications. That word, that yeah. term, seems to be getting trend, to be getting some traction right now. Right. So, the, but the issue I have with Microsoft is that last many years they have had very little innovation. They've had a lot of. Uh, I get, I get the email. So a lot of features. You know, now Postgres supports this package and this extension and but nothing new on synapse nothing new on purview no, nothing major in sql server or azure sql uh so i and now with the whole open ai i just feel that microsoft is like all into ai but not a lot of innovation has happened in the underlying pieces that i have seen unlike some other cloud providers they were late to market the thing that's unambiguously true is, is Microsoft was slow to build, you know, a fully competitive cloud analytics solution. I think Fabric is the, the you know, is the is it's their V3. Let me say that. I mean, Microsoft is classically, you know, they went through their. It's just a classic Microsoft, really. They they had the the Azure SQL thing first, and then they had Synapse, so the V1, and then V2, and this right. is the V3, and this is the real this is the real one. 
And and I mean, I can tell you they've been working hard. It's not like they've been doing nothing, but they, you know, they went through a fair amount of transitions and things. And and um, you know, Microsoft had, had certainly since the days I were there, I was there. While there are still are people on the SQL team that were the same people, they've gone through a lot of you know, there's been a lot of change in people and things over time. Um, but they're doing a good job now, and I feel like they've really they've built a product that for sure is going to be a you know a Microsoft class competitive product. I'll mm -hmm. say that, and it's classic Microsoft. It's going to be classic Microsoft. It's going to be better integrated end to end, perhaps than anything. Okay, but you know, on the other hand, I continue to think that Snowflake and other vendors will do really well in enterprise and places where they have lots of traction. And in general, I welcome the fact that I think there are now five viable competitive. Mm -hmm. modern data stack providers, you know, Snowflake and Databricks, and then the three clouds. Very nice. You know, it's so interesting to see how the, the data space is transforming. Like if we look at Snowflake, for example, I really feel that Snowflakes and, and Databricks, I'm not picking any sites here, are becoming the clearing houses for all data uh, related activities. What on top of, of the cloud providers, uh, like if you look at you know uh, data access governance, data security platform players, they are orchestrating the security policies to be run against the databases, but the execution is pushed down into the database. Which, Same, should, which is where it should be. That's where it needs to right, be. Right, because that's where data resides. I mean, it's in the data plane. There's a control plane. I mean, some of this stuff is basic concepts in, in, in IT systems that have been around for 30 years. There's a control plane and you know that that is your managed and your governance plane, and then right. you've got a data plane. And you need to do enforcement in the data plane. Although the 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 rules are should be specified in the control plane. You know, same thing for like DBT doing all the transformation, pushing it down. Cloud data platform, CDP, same thing. They've become like the authoring workflow control planes. Well, and, and the thing is, that's really helpful is that is that just about every SQL database supports role-based access control. Correct. So while you know you can criticize role-based access control as being relatively primitive in today's in today's world, at least it's a consistent layer across everything. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. The, what I've seen though is that doing everything in SQL can get a bit tricky. So these third-party companies are providing the UI to mm -hmm. drag and drop and then create your policies, author them, and then let the database call an API and let the database do all the uh, heavy lifting. Yeah. Yep. And then my big thing on that, you know, which I continue to believe very strongly is that we will build out over time uh, into a, more of a semantic model that describes the business process as well as the business security rules and regulations. And that's going to get encoded, you know, in, in what I believe will be a knowledge graph. And, and that will become a basis for doing this in the future. I do believe that's where the world is going. And in the interim, we'll use um, uh, less uh, less sophisticated storage technologies. The biggest challenge we have when we think about, about storing all of these rules and semantic content is there is no standardized database really that can do it. It's a, it's a custom bespoke application that you have to create. And I don't, and I think that the one thing that will help the industry dramatically is to standardize and, and to put, put this data inside a database. Hmm. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Bob, going back to Microsoft, you you were there in 1988 when Microsoft did not have a database of its own till it took, uh, partnered with Sybase. And you talk about how you started supporting Sybase and then, but Sybase, all the customer support calls were going to Sybase and they were using uh, SQL Server on Microsoft. And then finally, Cybers gave you the source code, so well there was a you know there was a relationship, there was a contractual relationship between Microsoft and Sybase, and you know that contract I think it was renegotiated in about 1992. I wasn't directly involved in the renegotiation of it, um, and that that provided Microsoft with access to the source. We we took a license to the Sybase source code with the ability to freely modify it on on Microsoft platforms, and Sybase had the ability to go off and do what they wanted to do. And, you know, they did reasonably well for a while, and they, you know, they, they were very strong in financial services, as an example. Um, ultimately, they were acquired by SAP. So, so do you think Microsoft uh, was 
bit too aggressive in the 90s. I remember we used to constantly read all the way up to early 2000s in how competitive they were in these small companies. Well, were, what we did have a little run in around <laughs> 2000 with the Justice Department, if I recall correctly. I do have some memories of that. So I think there was, you know, Microsoft behavior. But Microsoft was a very aggressive company. There's no question it was a very aggressive company. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot from that, uh, that period, you know, I was one of the 12 witnesses that testified um, in front of Judge, jo Judge, Judge Jackson, and they, you know, and, and, and it took on David Boyes uh, uh, on the other side. And then I, unlike almost anybody else at Microsoft, you know, when we, we had a little bit of challenges later on with a, a consent decree over pro quality of protocol documentation, I was the guy that got the executive that got 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 saddled with fixing that. Wow. And so I, for over almost three years, was flying back to Washington, D.C. every quarter and meeting with the DOJ and Judge Kohler Catelli to straighten out our protocol documentation mess, which we did and uh, it took a lot of work. But we did. And uh, 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 yeah, so I feel like I, I feel like I paid my dues and I learned my lessons along the way. Very nice. And and I think so did Microsoft, right? I think Microsoft they did. They did. Look at what's happening. And then look at Sacha, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Sacha is such a breath of fresh air. I mean, you know, I think of him like, you know, I think he's like the industry, the tech industry's Yoda. That's the way I think of, of Sacha. He's, you know, he's the, the biggest thinker and the, you know, the, the, the smartest guy around in so many senses. And and you got to give him credit for what he's done in this last year, partnering with OpenAI. I mean, it's yeah. certainly been, you know, incredibly beneficial to Microsoft stockholders, but but I think it's great for Microsoft and frankly great for the industry. Yep. E even embrace of open source uh, from uh, I remember many years ago, the number of Linux servers within Azure had already exceeded the number of Windows servers. Yeah, it was it was. Uh, I mean, Windows was it was. I mean, it, Linux was a, a was was a four letter word at at uh, <laughs> at Microsoft for a long time and. And I certainly had some, you know, some disagreements with Steve on on that. I mean, he, you know, he had, had felt that. Uh, I mean, both Steve and Bill really came out of an era, you know, from the 1980s where IP and patenting was a huge part of how you build software. You know, and while software patents still have a role in the world, um, I'm a big believer that innovation is where everything is at, and you know, open source is an incredible uh, 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 way of, of propagating um, information and knowledge between people and, and helping to uh, kickstart and, and get products going. So um, it's been great. I was really pleased to see, in particular in the announcements from Microsoft Build, I was particularly pleased to see the announcements of, 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 of them working closely with Hugging Face on open, open source models. Because the Microsoft team, is, you know, obviously with access to open AI, they're they kind of have, you know, they have the ability to to uh, uh, run these models at the lowest cost, and um, and so it's nice that they're looking at all kinds of models, not just the big, the big um, proprietary ones. That that is great. You have a much longer history with Bill Gates than with Satya, I would guess. Yeah, I, I worked with Satya from the time he joined Microsoft, though. I mean, oh, I very close. Oh, okay. So I mean, Bill was there before Satya, so yes. Right. So I, I know both of them well. I mean, at this point, I probably know Sacha at least as well as I know Bill. I see. The reason I was asking was because when I, when I was looking at your book, so right at the back, uh, or actually in front. Yeah, right in the front, there's this quote from Satya. I wonder, like, did you ask Bill for. I didn't ask Bill for a quote. I did not ask Bill for a quote. I did ask Sacha for a quote. Nice. Um, and I was thrilled to get that quote. It was a great quote from him. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So just for the readers, what uh, what Satya says is Muglia rightly refocuses us on the people, not just the algorithms and machines behind the next wave of artificial intelligence. So yeah, it's what the book's about. It's about the people, you know, the datapreneurs behind, you know, the technology that have shaped our lives over all these years. So let's talk about the book. In the book, you define yourself as an optimist and a realist. But if I had one word to pick that described you from reading the book, it's humanist. What what does that word mean? Well, it's interesting because I never really, I actually, this is an interesting story here in the sense that that I, 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 I sort of saw the term humanist when I was rereading a bunch of Isaac Asimov over the last couple of years. 
And, and he was a humanist very much. He was active in the humanist movement during his time as a, uh, he was, that he was alive. You know, and humanists are basically that people are people who believe in people and they believe that we make everything happen and that we make it happen while we're here on earth, basically. Yeah. So it's all about how we impact the world and how all of us work together um, while we're here. And it's just a realization that it's about us. And I think that's very apt for where we are right now because people are are affecting you know each other. They're working together. They're they're communicating socially and connecting globally in ways they never have before. You know. And meanwhile, we're at this incredible uh, uh, inflection point where we have this new technology and in artificial intelligence that you know appears to be having a profound impact on us. And I don't even think we have any idea as to how profound it's really going to be. Um, uh, and, but it's just at the beginning stages of that. So it's a time where we have to think of how the role of people. And the other thing that I think is so important, and this is something that's emphasized again and again in the book, is that is that whatever we're creating with these new machines, in the short term, they're tools that are, can be used as co-pilots and assistants to us. Maybe the, in the long term, they're artificial general intelligence that we can think of as an independent entity um, that we need to think about, you know, in a, in, a, in a much different way. But regardless, they're being created by people. You know, mm -hmm. people are creating these. And so the values that we that we instill into these into these tools and systems we create are more important than ever. You know, I've had the observation, and I've said this for years, that technology companies are a product of their values, and the products they create reflect the values of the company, very much so. And you can see the values in, in products if you look closely. And it partially, it's what do companies do? Where do they send you to? What are they? But in now, it's so different because now we're building agents that essentially are doing things on behalf of an organization in, you know, in the form of these artificial intelligence bots. And, and so they will do whatever they do based on the values that are imbued within them. And that's all built by the company or the organization that's creating the artificial intelligence or the product. So um, that is a critical element, you know, going forward. And, and I think that's very much gets back to my belief in humanism, um, that it's all about what we're doing as people and, and, and we are affecting our society and really no one else. There is this notion of Conway's law that says a product represents the org structure within the company. Yeah. I am today announcing a new law. It's called Muglia's law, which, which says that the product of a company reflects its values. That's true. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take that law. I'll take that law. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. If you want to give me that law, I'll take that law. No, and, and, and the point about the organization is also true. It is very true. And we saw that at Mike to say that Microsoft was Microsoft was the test case of this. I mean, you could you could tell what part of the company something came from by looking at the product pretty much because of, of the org structure and, and the, the personalities of, of, of the people. Um, so, yes, very, it's, it's very much it's very much true. The other thing that I think is really true, and this is one of the most important observations I've had as a as a technologist my entire life is where you end up. Is very much a product of where you started. Hmm. And, you know, going back to that Oracle question you asked me at the beginning, I, Oracle could never have ended up at Snowflake because they couldn't start with a blank sheet of paper. And so they could never, they would end up with, instead, they end up with the autonomous database instead. That's what they end up with instead, because they start with the Oracle database. Um, and, you know, and, and, and if you look at what's, you know, I, I think it's so interesting. You look at these five modern data stack platforms, they're all kind of building the same thing, but their platforms, each and every one of them are a reflection of where they started, right? Google started, you know, started with BigQuery, you know, really Dremel, let's be honest, they really started with Dremel and they didn't even start with SQL. I mean, SQL, they didn't even support SQL to 2017 or so. And, 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 and it didn't become their primary language until I think 2018, if I recall correctly. So they came from that perspective. Snowflake was SQL database inside and out, SQL data warehouse. Databricks, on the other hand, is data science. And so here we are, Snowflake is focusing very hard and adding all these data science capabilities 
And Databricks is focusing on, on adding all these data warehouse capabilities. And that's both a reflection of where they've started. Yeah, very true. I want to go back to, you had mentioned Isaac uh, Asimov. Uh, so you mentioned that you grew up in your formative years reading uh, the Isaac Asimov's books and short stories, and you read all of them. Most of them. He wrote over 450, like almost 470 oh, yeah. books. It's hard to read all of them. I read quite a few, though. 470 books? Four, I think his number is 469 he, he wrote or edited. Can you imagine? I wrote one, and it was a heck of a lot of work, let me tell you. I can't even imagine that. Oh, <laughs> My question to you is, after reading all this, these books, how did it shape your worldview in those years? Well, I think it, it, you know, although I didn't call myself a humanist, it really helped to make me a humanist. Mm -hmm. It made me realize the impact, you know, his, his perspective on the role of people and what would happen with people. Um, you know, I think, it, I think very much is a, it very much is a humanist perspective. And I think it wound up ha having that impact on me. It always, it also made me believe that, you know, we were going to create something ultimately bigger than ourselves. I've always believed that. The thing that is different is I didn't think I would see it. That seems, that's the big thing that's changed is that I grew up my entire life thinking, you know, yes, there would be Asmovian robots. There would be these things, but it'd be like 2100 when that happened. And, you know, and I'd be long gone. Now I'm like, gosh, that's probably 2035 or 2040 when that's going to happen. And I hope to be around at that point in time. Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, that's you know, sort of was a, a big wake up call for me in the last 12 months. Um, but in, in terms of shaping, you know, shaping me, I've always believed that 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 we would create machines that were intelligent and that would that that we would co-evolve in some way over a long period with them. Asimov was interesting in what he wrote. He he had a theory. His theory was, and he explained it even in one of his novels as to how he thinks it happened, which is that that you know in this galaxy that we live in with billions of stars, that people are the only intelligent species in that galaxy. That's his books almost all assume that, and he believed that, and he, and he wrote that his 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 reason for writing that is you know we evolved more quickly than other other um, uh, on, than other planets did because of the radioactive um, uh, uh, core that we have and it caused more genetic mutations and things. We even had a theory for why it would be true. But he had, he had humanity spreading across the galaxy um, together with robots, hand in hand with robots. But it was really, his, his, his writings on robots were so nuanced and thoughtful. And it was all based on this idea that robots are tools built by man to help people. You know, and, and Asimov invented, you know, the three laws of robotics, you know, a robot may not harm a human or allow a human to come to harm. A robot must obey the orders given to it by a person unless the orders uh, conflict the first law. And then the third law is a robot may protect itself as long as it doesn't conflict with the other two. So he wrote those with this idea that there would be these robots that are benevolent and they're tools helping us in a world with very imperfect people. And you know, and his stories were really parables. You can think of them as parables of, of, of how people who are quite imperfect are interacting these, with these machines that consistently follow these laws. And, you know, like this term, what does it mean to harm humanity or harm a human? Well, I mean, it's a very open-ended term, but it's explored throughout his, 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 his fiction. And, and he, he describes harm and he talks about that endlessly. In, in many different forms uh, as to, you know, as to what it means and, 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 and how humans can have harm inflicted upon them. Um, and he was very nuanced. He thought that he thought that uh, people on earth would reject robots. And in his world, the robots were all, you know, with what he called spacers, people that went into the solar system and explored the solar system and ultimately explored the stars. And it, he never saw robots developing, you know, on earth together with people. And ultimately, in his writings, ultimately, you know, the robots help guide humanity. And, you know, he comes up in his later novels, he comes up with this, this, this realization that the three laws are insufficient in a world where you have super intelligent robots, which he started to see in his later writing. And, you know, Asimov created what he calls the zeroth law, you know, which is that a robot may not harm humanity or allow humanity to come to harm. 
And you know, I think that's particularly poignant and important for us to consider as 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 kind of a foundation of of how we want to think about things as we work together with these more and more intelligent machines. That is so interesting. It was a few decades later, right? In seventy. Yeah, no, it was like nineteen eighties. He did it. He wrote these books. He got done writing his robot novels in the fifty. His robot stories, in, mostly in the nineteen fifties, and then he put it aside for almost thirty years. Oh. And didn't come back to it till his later robot novels that he wrote after the after the Foundation series. I um, wonder if he scared people, which is exactly what's happening today. And that's the, what I want to ask you about because this artificial general uh, AGI uh, that we are talking about is so close. You know, we see it in our lifetime. Uh, it has scared a lot of people. You know, in fact, Jeff Hinton left Google even. Yeah. People like uh, Yuval Noah Harari, they've all been saying there's this whole thing about let's pause all work on AI for six months. So what's what's your take on that? Well, I don't I, I'm not a supporter of pausing for, for time. I mean, A, I don't think you can stop these things. I just don't think you can stop. In fact, I know you can't stop. I mean, even if we stop, China wouldn't stop. I mean, it, it's you can't really stop. Um, these are these genies. Once they're out of the bottle, they're out of the bottle. There's no way to there's no way to avoid it. Um, and and in particular, we're seeing with what's happening with open source. It's it's really compounding. I'm super excited to see that Meta may release their model now. The the, the weights to their model in in a commercial form. I and mean, we just heard that in the last couple of days. Um, you know, after we've had the llama, and now we have you know the red pajamas and all these other things have been coming. Uh, uh, and and so it's been exciting. It's been exciting to see. You know, my view is that is that for the next five years or so, these things are all tools that will will be co-pilots and assistants to us. Longer than that, and you know, over some period of time, there will be. You know, I do believe they will become more than that. Um, and you know, I use the word entities just to talk about them as something that's not. You know, that that's different than 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 life as we know it, perhaps, but it has it has some interest in you know in terms of existence. Uh, and I think we need to think of these things as partners. Um, I believe very strongly that um, uh, that people will use uh, artificial intelligence for every purpose. You know, mm -hmm. there are millions of positive purposes for for artificial intelligence, and it's going to be applied in so many beneficial ways that are going to help us. And yes, people are going to create terrible deep fakes that are going to do awful things with it. We already see some of that happening. And that's because people take every tool and they do everything with it. But, you know, it's really about values and the values we instill that will determine, you know, the future of all of this. And ultimately, if we if we focus on building, you know, values that support people that are supportive of people, you know, and that support us working together, you know, as partners with these these new tools and ultimately maybe these new entities, um, then I think the right things will happen. So I'm an optimist in a positive future, you know, even in a world where where progress continues to speed up. You know, what's what we've been, you know, really the, the book, the, 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 the Datapreneur is, is about the arc of, 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 of data innovation and the innovation that's happened you know, really mostly in my lifetime. And, uh, and you know, the characteristic of it is progressively increasing progress, progress speeding up faster and faster. You know, and, you know, certainly in my years, I've watched things go faster and faster. I mean, it's ridiculous how much faster things are moving right now than they were, say, 30 years ago, when we were sending physical mail between people. I mean, email didn't even exist for most people back then, let alone Slack and social media and all this stuff. Um, and and so things are going faster and faster, and I think they're going to continue to go faster and faster. And but you know, and that really is what a technological singularity is: is an increase in human and machine progress at speeds that are are basically non-human speeds things happening faster than 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 we can and you know in that sort of an environment we better make sure these things are 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 uh working on our behalf that's why i like i like asimov's laws that's why i keep coming back to them and saying we while asimov hardwired these things into positronic brains and models have nothing hardwired into them they're completely malleable completely the opposite it's really incumbent about us to make sure that 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 as we build smarter and smarter things, that they follow rules that are appropriate for all of us.
what is this concept of singularity? And why the word singularity? What does it convey? Well, I mean, I think it really means everything's coming together in one, in you know, in in sort of one place, kind of, and then moving and you know, going, you know, heading towards infinity, essentially, is what you're looking at here. And this is the sort of belief, you know, this comes back to kind of an Asimovian belief that I have is very consistent with Isaac Asimov's writings that the purpose of us on this earth is to learn everything. That's really what we're here for: is to learn everything. Um, and you know, Asimov in the book, I end the book with. Um, one of Asimov's greatest short stories ever. In fact, it was his favorite short story, my favorite short story. It's many people's favorite short story. It's something called The Last Question, where Asimov really projects what he thinks could happen to humanity in the world over a period, you know, over a period of many centuries. Hmm. Interesting. Actually, longer than that, many, many, many periods, many people. Right. So are LLMs embodiment or singularity? Because if you train an LLM no. on the nice. not yet. I see. I mean, and I think the singularity is is what comes from faster and faster progress. You know, if you have machines that that really can, if you have machines that can, that are smarter than you know all of us, presumably they will be able to make progress faster. And you know, who knows? I mean, there's so many things. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen when, when quantum computing becomes a reality, right? I mean. We're gonna. I mean, I've always sort of believed that, and this is sort of naive. Of course, this is naive what I'm saying, and there's no, I have no evidence to, to back this up. But I've always believed that if there's a way to travel to the stars, it's going to be discovered through quantum computing. That's where it's going to get discovered. And and so, you know, if we learn, you know, and it and is it going to be us that if you know if if it is possible to break out of this solar system, will it be flesh and blood humans that go, or will it be robots? I'm going to bet on the robots. I'm going to bet on the robots because they're much better equipped to do those things than we are. They're much better equipped to do them. Just like we send robots all over the, sp the space these days yeah. and they do a very nice job for us. They do a very nice job for us. Like the new telescope, the James Webb telescope, right. which is a heck, one heck of a robot. Oh, wow. Wow. That's interesting. Never thought of it as a robot. It's a telescope, but it's, it's a device. I mean, it's not an autonomous robot. Correct. Okay. It, it, it's not autonomous, but you know, could you know these things could be Bob? Once we we start getting close and we get to AGI, what jobs are we going to be doing? For example, you know even now with GitHub Copilot and uh, your book mentioned, forty percent of all code is now written by Copilot, and yeah. it's the beginning. And it's really surprising because you know we we had always believed at first that 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 technology would you know if there were job displacement issues it would be. Not the, the not the information worker jobs that would be replaced. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, you know, yeah. copyright and things you can, you know, you can these things can do first draft stories really well, et cetera. And so there really are, you know, I was reading that potentially some people are already having this this issue, you know, in the journalism space. And uh, I think if you if you read, I mean, I, I recommend there was a blog that was written about a week ago. Mark Andreessen wrote it. Um, you know, said, you know, I, why AI will save the world is, I believe, the title. Okay, and and um, uh, it's a great blog. You should read it. He's also a super technical optimist. Um, uh, and, you know, he talked about the fact that 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 the concerns about the job displacement don't take into account the fact that as new technology comes out and new innovation, there's new opportunities. And that cycle has always created more jobs than it's eliminated. And he certainly believes that this will continue with AI. And I think there's good reason to believe that. I think there's a lot of reason for, for people to do. That said, I do think it's really important to, to say that it's quite challenging when you think about it from an individual's perspective and you put it in the perspective of time. Because you know, if AI, you know, if autonomous cars come, and AI winds up, you know, replacing a whole bunch of Uber and Lyft drivers. I mean, that will displace people. I mean, it'll have a real people impact. And even if those people could find, you know, there are other jobs that are created, it's not clear that they'll be the right, you know, it'd be trained to do those jobs or capable, you know, have the abilities to do those jobs. So it has a real human impact. And I do think that's going to be a concern. That has been a concern for, you know, through, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. I mean, the infamous buggy whip companies went out of business, right? And, and um, you know, and we'll see, you know, we'll see new buggy whip companies going out of business, you know, as new technology appears, but there'll be new opportunities. Um, I, you know, again, I continue to be an optimist that, that people will play a key role in all of this. 
I chuckle when I read you mentioned in one place AI has no common sense. At least to, to, today, that's true. It, it's getting you know it, 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 it's interesting. I think you know Jan written some really interesting things about this, and you know his whole view of the need for world models. Um, you know that is a perspective that you know many of the the, the technologists that are the leaders in 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 artificial intelligence believe. On the other hand, you know the open AI guys believe that that, that 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 those world models will get created by larger and large amounts of data. And there certainly is some reason to believe that that's true. And we see it somewhat in GPT-4, where GPT-4 shows much better reasoning capabilities than previous models did. You know, the planning of these models, I mean, there's still attributes that are, you know, are um, are really missing from these models. I mean, I think, I think in the in the doc in the in the book I said there's you know, I'm a program manager, product manager, so I specify things. That, that's what I always do for my job. What are the requirements? And you know, I think I said there's six attributes of machine intelligence. You know, the ability to sense. You know, have sensors that get data. That's pretty strong today. Um, the ability to learn. Um, uh, uh, people they can, we can learn, but we we don't uh, we don't aren't do continuous learning today. We do batch oriented learning, and that's clearly problematic. That's clearly not where it's going to be. We're going to have to have some kind of data flow structure where these things continuously learn. They need to reason. We're starting to see that, um, but still not all the way. They need to plan. Still weak there. Adapt. They're not adapting at all right now. That, they're not doing that at all. And then ultimately act. And we are definitely starting to see that take place. You know that that those capabilities will be added. So these things will evolve over time. I mean, I think one of the biggest things that is, you know is missing right now is that you know when you do a Chat GPT session. And you have multiple questions and things like that, and you tell it a bunch of things that it learns and it's smarter. You know, you end that session, and and the next time you get chat, it's going to forget that. It's not going to remember that. It's totally gone. Now, mm -hmm. OpenAI remembers it. They stuff all that data in a database, and then they can use it later for training. But it's not an immediate thing. It's not like boom, the model is immediately smarter mm -hmm. and it gains this knowledge like we would, right? That's how we work. You tell me something, I know it immediately. I may forget it, but but I knew it. In the, uh, I think GPT-5 is, I'm starting to hear it's soon coming out at some point. I want to go back to- uh, does it, Is it going to do that? Do you, have you heard that it's going to do that, that constant learning? I've, I've not, I don't, I don't, I've not heard much about GPT-5. So. I've heard that the limit on the size of context is going away. So right now it's limited to 8K, GPT yeah, going to 32, going to 30. GPT 4, the, that limit is going to go away. I don't know how they'll do it because that context has to be saved in memory. So the memory is limited. Yeah, but... yeah they're going to have to, you know, it, it's interesting. But it's, it's fascinating to think about how these models will evolve to, you know, take this new content and essentially adjust their weights appropriately, et cetera. It'll be interesting. You're not talking about constant learning, but... Uh, uh, I was reading, you know, iPhone five. Uh, I uh, sorry, I iPhone iOS seventeen. As people are going to leave you a voicemail, it'll start showing you what they're saying, and then you can say, "Oh, that's a call I do want to take," and you can pick that call. So that's how. That's pretty cool. I, I look forward to that feature. That'll be a good. Yeah, feature. yeah. A call and, screener. That's really call screening. I mean, that's a great way of doing call screening. But calls, calls. Yeah, that's right. In real time. Yep. Uh, and it's doing the the speech to text conversion. Speech, it turns out, is pretty. You know, it's it, it's funny because I've been, you know, one of my datapreneurs is X D, you know, who's who's been at Microsoft for a long time, um, and uh, uh, he's technical fellow. He's been a technical fellow there, and he worked on speech. You know, he built the speech models from the early days, and speech used to be so hard, but they changed. You know, what happened is when the neural network technology was started being developed in 2012. Um, that everybody flipped over to it. And all of a sudden, you know, both transcription and translation started working. And we now have amazing products in both of those cases, things from many different vendors, really. This is an interesting topic. This is where I want to pick your mind on. You talk quite a bit about cloud data warehouses, SQL engines, reverse ETL. Why do I need all of this in future? If I can bring the data into some storage format, vectorize it, I can then just talk to it, and you know, Bard even today uh, does supports hundred different languages. 
So I can ask a question in one language, you can ask it in a different language. Why do we need to go through this elaborate modern data stack that we have today? The one piece, if you think about where the AI affects the modern data stack the most, it primarily affects it at the top of the stack, which is the human interface. That's the place where it today affects it the most. It will have more and more, and we're already using machine learning, mostly traditional machine learning, frankly, not the next, we have two, we have MLV1 and MLV2. You know, there's MLV1, which is you have all the features and you set up the features and things. MLV2 is these, is these large foundation, is foundation model based. Um, but but people use MLV1 today to do data quality analysis, for example, to look for an, an anomalous data points and things like that. So ML is embedded in the data stack in some ways. You know, most of the data stack, I don't think, changes dramatically with these language models because the data still needs to be collected and you still need to use essentially mathematical techniques to do an average, a median, a sum, you know, whatever function you want to apply to the data, you need to have something that can add up, you know, in the case of Snowflake, potentially billions or even trillions of columns of rows in a, in, a, in a table and to do it darn fast. Now, that is never going to be a language model that does that. You know, it may be the language model. It may be a foundation model that is written the SQL to define it or whatever you're using to define it, but you're still going to have an engine to go through data. And I think it just makes a lot of sense. And, it, it, you know, the analogies, you know, uh, my friend Mol Hamaraf at Relational AI, you know, really taught me about the the, the importance of, of, of intelligence together with knowledge. You know, knowledge is essentially data that mm -hmm. has been analyzed and some conclusion has been drawn, drawn from it. I mean, that's knowledge, essentially. And of course, you know, is the conclusion accurate or not? We could go into all sorts of conversations about that and spend the rest of the time philosophizing about that. But, but you still need an engine to add all these things up. And just like we, you know, we have, we have a neural network in our heads, but we sure like to use an Excel spreadsheet with that. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm really bad at adding up a column of, you know, a hundred numbers. I'm not very good at it. And maybe GPT five or six will be better at it, but I still think it's going to want to have a database behind it to do that function. And in fact, we're seeing that right now that, you know, as these models are being augmented, you know, with these add-ins now that, that we have those, that you have, you know, essentially, essentially symbolic calculators. You know, the most famous, you know, the one that's done probably the best job out of the gate is Mathematica, plugging right into GPT-4. I mean, if you ask GPT-4 a, a mathematical question, chances are it'll give you the wrong answer. Yeah. If you ask it, with, if, if we ask it to ask him in Mathematica, it'll, it'll probably give you the right answer. Yeah. One thing I really like is the fact, I, I love an analogies. And I really like the analogy you have in the book, where if you ask, a keyword-based search, so a question like, did George Washington own uh, an iPhone. iPhone? It'll probably, you know, try to do keyword match and, you know, give, I, I, I don't even know what kind of question answer it'll give, but in AI, because it has a context and the notion of time and how do you explain that? I, I think that was a very brilliant example to show the difference between a semantic search and a keyword search. Well, and what's happened is, frankly, these models have, you know, as the models have advanced beyond like GPT-2 to GPT-3, 3.5, and now 4, that concept of, of that idea of having a concept of time has now actually been, been, been built into the semantic model that's in there. Now, it, it figured it out itself. I mean, it, you know, by getting all of this data, you know, it's not like somebody said, here's what time is, you know, and, and, and programmed it specifically. It, it was able to learn that from looking at all the data that it that that it was trained on, um, and that you know this again comes back to a little bit of the disagreement that exists today in the AI communities about how much we have to explicitly program these world models versus how much these things will be trained, you know, how much they'll learn from. You know, what we now know for sure, and this is you know this has been very clear, is is that is that these language models um, need to be augmented with data in order to get the right answers. And, you know, the way people are doing that today primarily is through a semantic search using some form of a vector database where they, you know, vectorize the content and then use that as a semantic lookup to, to feed into the, the GPT prompt, basically.
to give it a better answer. Bill Gates has said that the revolution in AI is the biggest thing he's seen since the invention of transistor chips. Transistors. Is that is that I agree. I mean, I mean, I think it's the most significant advance in my lifetime. I look computers can respond to English now. Hmm. Or other languages, other native languages, but they're particularly good at English because there's a lot of English words, you know, there's a lot of English content out there for them to be trained on. And and this is remarkable. This is a remarkable thing that was never possible before. I mean, you know, we had Siri and Alexa, but those were those were all semantic-based things where, you know, they're essentially essentially rules-based things where they know a certain number of things they can do and they and they and they, you know, understand they, they parse the words. Now they're operating at a totally different level because there's this neural network model behind that are behind these things. And um uh and remarkably, English has become an API. I mean, I can't that that of all the things that makes my head explode, it's this idea that English is an API. And and you know, in GPT-4, when you tell it to call an API, you describe it in English. You explain the the, the text in you know the, the the how you actually make the, the call in English, which is just mind-boggling to itself. Um and and you know, I think we're gonna see models. I think what we're going to see, and now especially with you know, the explosion of open source models that are that are being created. You know, we're going to see systems that have a model in it talking to another system that has a model, and they're going to use English as the interface between the two, which again makes my head explode. <laughs> you, you, yeah, no, this is this is fabulous. You mentioned in the book that Bill Gates had this concept of I A Y F. And that's coming yeah. to yeah. So what, what is I A Y F? Seems like it's coming to fruition. Well, it has come to fruition, and it came to fruition before AI, frankly. I mean, IAYF had no concept of AI in it, but it really had this concept of search. I mean, it was the idea was that you should be able to, this idea of information at your fingertips, which Bill announced in 1990 at, at a speech in Comdex. You know, you got to take yourself back to 1990. First of all, you know, Windows barely worked in 1990. Let's remind ourselves of that. I mean, it, it you know, it was, it was, it was a 16 bit operating system. You know, you could barely keep you know the the applications running for for the full session, and um and Bill had this idea that from your desktop you should be able to get information anywhere across you know within your company and have access to that and and have multiple applications working together. And um, at Microsoft, we pursued this vision you know in some depth, largely unsuccessfully. But in parallel to the work, you know, we succeeded in creating Office and Windows got good over time and things like that. But um, uh, but it, what really happened in, in the meantime was the internet got created and HTML became a standard, you know, a, a standard way of, of storing text data to, to, to have it be visualized by people. And, you know, and that became information at your fingertips. And, you know, the company that I sort of looking at, at the one that did more to advance that than anyone was Google um, with, you know, with Google search. And I still mark you know, I believe it was August of 20, 2004 when Google went public as, you know, the day really the internet took off. And, and frankly, that was when we came out of that downturn period as well. So that's I recall quite well. This has been such a fascinating chat. I can go on forever. We've all re reached end of our time. I'd like to end on a fun question. So my question for you is, which place in the world is your favorite? Oh, that's easy. New Guinea. New Guinea as New in... Guinea, New Guinea. Um, yeah, I've been there like four times. It's it's oh, wow. you know, it is it is uh one of the most, you know, the people live there like they've lived for you know thousands of years. Wow. Um there are, you know, of the world's languages, however many you count, 700 of them are spoken in New Guinea. Yeah. New Guinea's not that big, it's not tiny, but it's not that big. 700 different languages. And that's because the tribes live, you know, it's so mountainous and heavily forested that tribes can live a mile apart and never see each other, literally never see each other. We didn't even know there were people in the center of New Guinea until like the 1930s. And um, uh, and it's just the culture is so fascinating. It's, you know, again, I'm interested in people and the culture. You know, we love those sort of we love the you know the the the, the Pacific Islands and you know the, the 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 and some of the earlier the cultures that have been developing there. And so fascinating to see um, the way people live. And and you know, it's fascinating to watch as they modernize. 
um, mm -hmm. over time as they begin to get technology into their lives. That's, that's amazing. Sounds like another episode. There are so many questions to ask you about Papua New Guinea now, but we keep it for next time. I want to thank you so much for coming to this podcast. It was, as always, a huge pleasure to have you on. It was great to see you, Sanjeev. Thank you. Bye.